So I just want to read the scope of what the flood is described as. How big, how devastating, how long. So I'm going to read Genesis 7 really quick. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the seventh day of the month, and on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open. And the floodgates of the sky were opened. The rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. And the waters prevailed more and more upon the earth, so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. The water prevailed 15 cubits higher, and the mountains were covered. So all the creatures that moved on the earth persisted birds, livestock, animals, and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth, and all mankind, and all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils were the breath of life, the spirit of life, died. So the scope is pretty clear. Everything. Anything that was not in the ark died. And so much so that it covered the mountaintops by like 20 extra feet. That's a lot. And so some people try to interpret this to be local. And so you can ask questions like, why didn't Noah just like move? Like if this was a local flood, why didn't he just leave the area? Why didn't God gave him a hundred years almost to build this ark? Just walk away. I'm sure you could make it a couple miles east of there and be fine. Why didn't the animals just fly or herd away? Why did he have to bring them all to the boat? It doesn't make any sense. The text is talking about something that covered the globe. It covered the, the mountains and it's destroying everything because all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. That's what scripture says. God wanted to recreate planet earth start anew with a family that was still walking according to his ways. That's why he did this. So altogether, the flood, before they were actually able to leave the ark, was almost a year. I think they calculated 360 days. That's how long the floodwaters were on the earth. They were growing, becoming higher and higher for 150, and then it took another, about the same amount of time, a little bit more, to recede. So this is that same record, right, we're looking at on, on your handout. And the idea is evolution from simple creatures to more complex creatures over millions, if not billions, of years. That's the interpretation we talked about. That's what we're being taught in class. The next idea, instead, is a pattern of burial. If there was a global flood that covered all of the mountains and its whole goal was to destroy everything that was corrupted except Noah and who else was with him on the ark, this was going to be a massive disaster that's never been seen before, and so much so that God promised never to do it again. So this is going to tear apart mountains. It's going to tear the continents to pieces. It's going to wipe out the cities that were on the earth. It's going to tear rock and sediment, mud, and everything off the continents. It's going to... Pro Creation scientists have looked at plate tectonics, and they're trying to figure out what would have happened, and they've even interpreted the great vents of the deep being the tectonic plates ripping open, earthquakes happening. Uh, underwater pools exploding, uh, volcanoes. It, it was something that was, again, never to happen, and it was so vast that everything died. We can look at volcanoes today and see how destructive they were. Imagine that happening around the globe all at the same time. This leveled everything and drastically reshaped the face of the earth, which is what God wanted. That's what God was going to do. So if that happened, what's the first thing that would have been buried you guys, what do you think? Things that lived in the mud. The bottom of the ocean, right? As the waters came up and the rock and mud that's being stir, uh, stirred up is getting deposited in the deepest place, which is bottom of the ocean. It's going to cover all those little worms that they're pointing to that they say were the first life. Little clams and crustaceans that are running on along the bottom. Fish that can't go very far because that's their environment is on the bottom of the earth. Slowly going to move up to larger fish that can swim away or get away from the mud and rock and silt that's coming down from the flood, they're going to try and get away. Eventually, they're going to succumb to it as well. As you move up through the rock record, you start to hit things that are on land. As the waters are rising, you're going to hit plants. Amphibians and things that are stuck in small ponds, they can't leave, right? So they're going to get covered next. And then you're going to keep moving. Larger reptiles, crocodiles, things like that that could move out of their environment, but they're still not going to get very far. And lastly, you're going to get the dinosaurs, things that are going to be climbing up the sides of hills and mountains, things that can possibly swim on the surface of the water. But for a year, this thing is going on, raging storms. They're not going to live through it unless they have that boat, and they're not on it. They, too, are going to die. So instead, 
you see a rising floodwaters, a pattern of burial. Not simple to complex, but what was buried first to what was buried last during this year of calamity, of disaster. It matches up really well with how the flood is said to have happened. It happened first deep underground in the oceans. Well, those are the things that are buried and died first. And then slowly it rained for 40 days and 40 nights and the floodwaters prevailed up over the mountains. That's the end of the flood. Well, the things that could climb the highest finally died. It matches perfectly. So then they'll go, you can interpret it that way, but rocks take millions of years to form. They're not fast. They take millions of years to form. They'll look at the rates at which rocks form today. Little sand bits and mud on the bottom of the river. They're slowly building up, things like that. It takes forever. You can't get all those creatures to be covered in less than a year of time. That doesn't make any sense. Well, we look at things that have happened today, things that have happened recently, and we see that rocks do form quickly. At least they can under the right, right circumstances. So in 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted, or more accurately exploded. Uh, the type of volcano that it is, it's very volatile. Um, the type of lava or magma that it is is very thick. So what it starts to do, it starts to bulge instead of just flow out. So like in Hawaii, you can see all the lava just pouring out and running like a river. That's very thin. Here it's very thick, and so it starts to bulge. All of that steam and pressure underneath starts to build. Earthquakes start to happen. And finally, it lets go. And when it does, it is disastrous. And so what happened during this time period, the whole side of this started to bulge and there was a huge earthquake and it gave way and it was, instead of vertical, it blasted out the side. It leveled the forest around it for miles. It surged through Spirit Lake, which is the lake right next to it, which created a huge wave that wiped out the rest of the forest and drug it back into the lake. Much of the life there was instantly killed. And you had this huge pyroclastic flow that was going down the side of it, covering everything. Ash clouds were around the globe for up to 15 days. This thing was massive. This is just one volcano, and it's not the biggest one either. We've had things that are 80 times larger than this go off <laughs> in historical times. And so why do, why do I bring this up? Um, because the type of features that we saw from this thing that happened in hours are very similar to what we see out in nature that we say take millions of years to form. We watched this happen. There was cameras rolling, helicopters flying around, and days after, they were seeing thick rock layers forming. And it's causing people to ask questions. Wait, I thought this took millions of years. Well, when you have a disaster of this size, sometimes it only takes hours or days. And so this is fast deposition. Uh, I got this from a book called Footprints in the Ash um, by John Morrison and Steve Austin. If you haven't read that book, I highly suggest reading it. So this is a picture from him. This is just the top section of the deposit at the bottom, the base of Mount St. Helens. Just the top of it. In certain sections, it was almost 600 feet thick. The bottom portion is what's called tephra. So this is any of the large portions of ash that were kind of floating and they would settle out. This middle section is the pyroclastic flow. So when that thing gave way and exploded, it was just a billowing cloud of gas and liquid and ash. And it just poured down the side of this mountain when it exploded. And it deposited almost 25 feet of rock. I mean, when it first was, it was not solid, right? It's still puffy, it's ash, it's all this other stuff. And then on top, two years later, they had another eruption, not like, not as big as this one, but this is mud. So on the top of that mountain, you get snow because it's higher elevation, but when it gets really hot, right, it's erupting, all that snow is going to either vaporize or melt all the surrounding material, the rock, the silt, the mud, it's all going to liquefy. It forms what's called a lahar. It's a huge mud flow. It's very disastrous. It runs down the sides, can pick up buildings, and just, it just runs things over. And this is deposited in one afternoon. This is really, really fast. And five years later, when we were trying to conservation, we're trying to protect this area and help it come back from this disaster, these things were starting to be solidified. Because when you have a lot of pressure, you have a lot of heat, and all of the water is removed from this, things start to solidify. Well, this is the perfect scenario. These things within five years have started to form solid rock up to 600 feet thick in different places. And another key uh, thing is here. You see all these thin layers right here? 
scientists, when they find these kinds of rocks, typically they'll say each layer took about a year to form because it's alternating seasons. They say that certain muds are deposited during the summer and certain are during the winter or uh, during a drought or not. Well, this is one flow that made how many alternating layers, and some of them are like a knife's edge thin. If we didn't watch this happen and we came back later, we're like, well, one, two, three, four, f no, we, this happened instantly. This happened in one flow going down the side of it. These are features that we used to think took millions of years to form, happened in one afternoon. We watched it happen. So, do rocks take millions of years to form? No, they don't. If you have the right circumstances, this is what happens. So imagine the globe covered in volcanoes exploding, earthquakes happening, massive floods, water for 40 days and 40 nights. When, water, when it's raining torrentially for just 24 hours, it's disastrous. Like rivers overflow, houses are eroded away, like it's massive. Imagine that for 40 days and 40 nights across the whole planet. That's a lot of water. It's gonna cause a lot of destruction. Plus the fact of the rising sea levels, everything, everything was gone. If this happens in one afternoon from one eruption, this is all happening across the globe. Imagine what rock layers could have been destroyed and remade. God wanted to reshape the surface of the planet to make it new again. This is what happened. There is evidence for the Bible all over the place. They just use a different way of interpreting it. So, they claim that these rocks have been scientifically dated to be millions of years next. So this is the next thing. Well, no, we checked our work. We, we did a study. We did radioisotope dating. We know how all these things are. It, it, it fits our description. Okay. Well, we have scientists who have studied that as well. Right? We want to test ourselves. We want many people to do the same study to make sure scientifically this method stands up. Right? Well, there's been plenty of studies where they've tested this on rocks that we know the age of. So it's kind of like Mount St. Helens. There was a new lava dome that actually appeared on the top of that because there's been subsequent eruptions and volcanic activity. And scientists have gone at the top of that, taken rock samples, sent it off to radiometric dating labs. So they didn't do it themselves. So there's no bias here. They sampled it, sent it over, and they got dates. And they said it was millions of years old on a second. That happened 20 years ago. That doesn't make any sense. And they will say, well, you can't do radioisotope dating on rocks that are that young because it shouldn't show anything. Right, so why is it? If young rocks are showing old ages, then how do you know that your old rocks are actually old? You don't. Your assumptions are wrong. That does not fit. Look at all these things that have been tested, right? These are known ages. These have been documented throughout the years. Historically, people watched it happen. We know how old these are. And all of these yet millions of years? That doesn't make any sense. This should call into question this, this dating method. And often they just go, nah, your samples were contaminated. You didn't do this right. Your methods are wrong. Uh, the lab did it incorrectly. These are all the excuses they use. But after how many times are you finally going to say, wow, this is kind of stacking up? There's a whole nine-year study called RATE radioisotopes in the age of the earth where they did this repeatedly and showed it always comes back this way. It looks old, but it's not because we watched it happen. Um, there was an island, this is, I don't have a slide for this, but this is a good point, called Surtsey. Uh, I think it's off the coast of Iceland or Greenland. So it's a volcano that was just off the coast of it and it came up out of the ocean as it was producing rock and the rock was going to solidify and it formed a whole island in just like less than a decade. The shocking thing, though, is that as the waves beat against the rocks it was forming and creatures started to show up and reefs started to form, things like that, it looked shockingly old. And there are quotes from scientists and environmental biologists showing, this thing looks like it's been here for thousands of years, and we wouldn't believe it if we hadn't seen it with our own eyes. Then you should be looking at this data and going, well, maybe we don't know this very well. Something is wrong with our assumptions about how dating works. So, do rocks form through millions of years? No. They can be formed very quickly if you're given the right circumstances. And I think a global flood that was meant to wipe out everything and reshape Earth to make it new again can provide that. So, again, I point back to this because I go through 
the science of radioisotope dating. I explain why it's, I think it's reliable, how the math actually matches up, and then how they go through studies like these to show something's wrong. It doesn't fit perfectly. We should probably rethink this. And they're not going to, though, because if you get rid of millions of years, you get rid of the process of how long it takes for evolution. You get rid of the fossil record because you can't do a chain of events, which means Earth is probably fairly young and it reshapes all of Big Bang theology or uh, Big Bang cosmology. It seems like a god created it. Hmm. We don't want to do that. A lot of scientists would probably lose their degrees. A lot of scientists would lose their jobs if they started to think about this. And a lot of science that's been done for the last 200 years is just wiped off the face of the planet. No one's going to do this. But it's there. So um, there's also a lot of studies um, down here where a scientist will show up and they'll date a rock because they want to know how old the fossil is that are in rocks around it because they're trying to figure out the pattern of evolution, right? And they'll date a rock and go, hmm, 200 million years, got it. Another scientist will go, no, that doesn't match up. And they go do it. It's only 2 million years. What are you doing? And there are places where this has been done five or six times. They've all done the same thing. And it ends up being dependent on the scientist's interpretation, not the dating method. Because they'll use a different element to date it or a different method because that's not what I think it was. Which one of you is right? Because you all used a foolproof method according to you. Which one? None of them. Like it, it just doesn't fit. But they don't recognize this because it's, it is the accepted method. Everyone agrees with this, so it has to be. If it's not, it's contamination. You did your methods wrong. And they will belittle each other until they no longer have a degree or even any credibility, and it's crazy. If you read through the scientific literature, it's outrageous.